Pangana Ian Anderson, Palawa Chowala, Pamarana, Chowala Wai Palama Marana, University of Melbourne, Katuma Damine, Morandri Tiana, Kanamina Nina Nika Lenina. It's a protocol of Aboriginal peoples to pay respects to the custodians of place, in this case the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I do so on behalf of my mother's people, whose traditional country is a place called Lurapana on the island we call Trawana or Tasmania. I honour the Wurundjeri ancestors and their Narangata or clan elders, and I also pay respect to the Aboriginal peoples of the country of Nam, this, this area of country here, Port Phillip Bay. The, the Boonwurrung uh, who share the country of Birrung, the Yarra River, the Wadarung from beyond the Werribee River, the Jajawarung and the Tangawarung peoples of central Victoria. I acknowledge our elders and our community. Uh, my name is Ian Anderson. I'm the Professor for Indigenous Higher Education here at the University and also the Pro Vice Chancellor Engagement for the institution. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to tonight's Human Rights Lecture and it's especially an honour to welcome our lecturer, Kirsty Schwartz Gujimal. I would like to begin by noting the significance of the date. Today is November 12, a day of special importance in the life of Timur Lest. It is significant because November 12, 1991 was the date of the Santa Cruz Cemetery Massacre in Dili, a horrific, an horrific event which became the turning point in the international struggle for self-determination and the independence of the people of Timor-Leste. In almost eight years between the Dili massacre and the UN-supervised popular referendum on independence of August 1991, important political work was done in many countries to support the international solidarity of the people of Timor-Leste. Few have given more to support that cause and especially the cause of women and children in Timor-Leste than Kirsty Stuart Gujmal. As a part of that story, I'm delighted to begin by mentioning that Kirsty is an arts and education graduate here at the University of Melbourne, and also to share with me uh, growing up in our teenage years in Bendigo and going to school in, the, in central Victoria. After her studies here, she worked with Australian Volunteers International and the Refugees Studies Program at Oxford. In 1991, she joined the English television crew in East Timor as a researcher interpreter for the project that produced the important doc documentary In Cold Blood, The Massacre of East Timor. Kirsty also worked and lived for four years as a teacher and a human rights uh, campaigner in Jakarta where she met her future partner and the first president of Timor-Leste, Jeanne-Nana Gujmal. In 2001, Kersey created the, the Alola Foundation, whose early goal was to appro oppose sexual and gender-based violence. Today, this foundation supports a wide range of programs as assisting women and children in Timor-Leste. She remains true to her vocation as an education, as we have witnessed in many uh, previous visits here to this uh, university. A supporter of many initiatives to develop curriculum for schools and reading resources for the people, in 2007 she was named the Goodwill Ambassador for Education for Timor-Leste by the nation's second president, Jose Ramos Horta. For this human rights lecture, Kesti has chosen the important topic of language rights, education and identity in Timor-Leste. It's a real honour to call on her to speak now, and please join me with walking her, her back uh, here to the University of Melbourne for this important lecture. Thank you very much, Ian. Boa tarde. Good afternoon, everybody. I greatly appreciate and value the opportunity afforded by this human rights lecture to share a few reflections with you on some issues that have consumed my energy and have been very much front of mind for me over the last 15 years or so in my adopted homeland of Timor-Leste. They are the issues of language and how it relates to national identity, human rights, language policy and education. 
They are of deep and abiding interest to me, not only because they're vitally important to the process of rebuilding Timor-Leste from a fragile post-conflict nation into a rich and vibrant democracy, but also because they resonate for me in a very special, personal way. In fact, the roots of my passion for matters language and education related lie here at Melbourne University where I completed my Bachelor of Arts degree, majoring in modern languages in the 1980s. It was also here at Melbourne University that I first made the acquaintance of the East Timorese dissidents who inspired me to take up the cudgels of their quest for independence. I recall very fondly attending small gatherings of um, East Timorese on the South Lawn or in the John Med Medley building, which is where I was studying Indonesian language at the time. And I listened in awe to their personal stories of courage and determination in the face of terrible suffering, daily violations of their fundamental rights and freedoms, including their inalienable right to self-determination. My conscience was pr pricked. I turned some of the skills that I acquired here at Melbourne University to the benefit of the independent struggle by translating some of the copious human rights reports reaching my student colleagues and helping to disseminate them wide widely. Upon graduation from Melbourne University, I joined forces with a dedicated team of human rights defenders at the Australian Council for Overseas AIDS Human Rights Office, which was then operating out of the old Uniting Church building in um, Napier Street in Fitzroy. I volunteered for the magazine Inside Indonesia, produced and edited at that time out of the same office, and it was through this experience that I broadened my understandings of Indonesia itself, of human rights, of rampant corruption and military abuse of power, and of the quest of its renegade provinces for secession from the unitary state of Indonesia. Over the past 15 years or so, I've been described as many things, including a spy and an undercover agent. And it's with great pride that I refute these things and insist that actually I'm a human rights activist at heart. In fact, when I think of all of the work that I've done over the past decade and a half, the term human rights activist continues to describe best the role that I've played. Let me share with you just a little bit of a snapshot of where Timor-Leste stands today in its nation building um, efforts. You probably haven't heard much about the country and about recent developments in the media. Um, I remember a number of years ago, Mem Fox, the uh, famous children's author said to me, it's such a shame that peace isn't more interesting. <laughs> and of course what she meant was that really in peacetimes, um, we don't really we don't really hear any news. So you can assume that if you don't hear anything about Timor Leste, that things are going along quite quite smoothly. And indeed, uh, on the whole, they are. The UN Development Program's uh, Human Development Index of this year, 2014, shows that Timor Leste has gone from being next to the bottom of the development scale in 2000 to improving by about 20%. Almost no other country has developed this much over that period of time. Life expectancy, which was under 56 years as recently as 2005, is now over 62, while infant mortality has declined from being the world's worst at 24% in 1980 to around 8% in 2005 to 4.5% now. In fact, in large part due to the wonderful health promotion work of my foundation, the Alola Foundation, Timor-Leste has successfully attained Millennium Development Goal number four, relating to a reduction by two thirds um, of rates of infant mortality. It's the only MDG that is on target to be met by Timor-Leste by 2015. In terms of gender equality too, we're doing fairly well with impressive levels of political representation in major uh, institutions of state. 
19 of our 65 members of parliament are women, and women hold three important ministerial posts, justice, social solidarity, and finance. We're not doing so well at the local government, local government level. Only 2% of all chefe de suku, or hamlet chiefs, are women. Milena Pires, former UNIFEM representative in Timor-Leste, was sworn in on the 11th of July 2010 as the first Timorese elected as a member of the CEDAW committee. This key international post and our finance minister, Amelia Pires's heading up of the G7 Plus Forum of 20 fragile nations, and it's a forum representing some 350 million people around the world means that Timorese women today have a voice on the global stage. And I'll come back later to talk a little bit further about the G7 Plus Forum and share with you some, of, some reflections on Timor-Leste's important championing of the rights of fragile states in their battle to be heard and respected by large first world donor nations. Within a year of independence, Timor-Leste became a party to seven of the nine core human rights treaties, including CEDAW and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Nevertheless, it can't be denied the failure of justice is a critical human rights concern. In particular, there are problems associated with an inefficient legal system, which frequently deprives citizens of a fair trial, the use of excessive force by police and a pervading sense of impunity for past human rights breaches. The judicial system suffers from a serious lack of uh, human capacity and an over-reliance on international judges and uh, legal advisers. There are also significant language barriers as although Tetum and Portuguese are both official languages of East Timor, Portuguese is the main legal language which most of the population doesn't speak. Add to these challenges fresh concerns in relation to the independence of the courts due to the recent decision by Parliament to expel, um, I believe, eight international just judges and you'll appreciate that there is a long way to go before citizens of Timor-Leste enjoy full confidence in the institutions designed to uphold and protect their human rights. As a mother and as a teacher by training, I completed my Diploma of Education here at this university in 1988. I've naturally taken a great interest in efforts to rebuild Timor-Leste's education system. Education offers Timor-Leste a shortcut out of poverty and underdevelopment and is the number one means of addressing gender inequalities, poor maternal and child health outcomes, women's economic dependence on men, etc., etc. Billions of dollars of foreign aid and technical assistance have been pumped into the education sector over the past decade. As a result, large numbers of schools have been rebuilt from the rubble left in the wake of Indonesia's bloody withdrawal in 1999. Teachers have been trained, national education laws enacted, school feeding programs commenced, um, a program of accreditation of our private tertiary institutions in implemented and a system of nine years basic uh, free compulsory education introduced. As Goodwill Ambassador for Education, the issue of education quality concerns me greatly. The exodus of the bulk of our trained teachers in 1999 left us with a diminished cohort of teaching professionals, particularly at the secondary level. In our haste to get schools reopened quickly back in 2000, large numbers of high school graduates were, re were recruited to fill the gaps. And in spite of annual rounds of in-service teacher trainings, one of the biggest challenges that we face today relates to teacher capabilities and in particular, knowledge and practice of modern child-centred teaching me methodologies which engage children actively in their learning. Research has shown that in the average classroom, students speak only 2% of the time. 
The teacher typically stands at the blackboard and due to a lack of books and teaching aids will copy words from a textbook onto the board for all the children to copy into their exercise books. The teacher may then engage um, the children in a brief formulaic exchange on the subject area being taught, often prompting the students to respond in a kind of fill the gap sentence type ritual along the lines of the human body is divided into parts. Um, and this is often the extent of the engagement um, you know, between teacher and student. Independent thought and creative expression have no place in this pedagogy and with average contact hours in the primary school classroom totalling no more than about um, three hours per day, learning is severely hampered and children's self-esteem damaged. I'd like now to share with you um, a few thoughts on the matter of language and language use in education, um, since these are really vital issues for consideration in efforts to improve access to and quality of education. They also have a very direct bearing on children's ability to exercise their right to compulsory primary education. In sociolinguistic terms, Timor-Leste is an extremely rich nation with some 16 indigenous or local languages in addition to the lingua franca and co-official language, tetum, in daily use around the country. The Constitution of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste defines tetum and Portuguese as the, official two, as the two official languages of the country, as I mentioned earlier, with Bahasa Indonesia and English referred to as working languages. In addition, our Constitution makes mention of the state's obligation to conserve and to develop our local languages, a handful of which are already faced with imminent extinction. Only one surviving speaker of the Makua language of Lao Tem district, which is the easternmost um, district in the country, um, is an old lady in her 80s. And um, she's the only known speaker of this, uh, this language. Of course, soon she will die. And with her a precious, irreplaceable tool and symbol of identity for her, her family, her nation. A comparative analysis of the 2004 and 2010 census data presents a rather disturbing uh, picture in terms of language loss involving some of the larger language groups too. For example, um, numbers of speakers of Mumbai, which is a you know, relatively widely spoken um, language amongst the local languages, dropped from 131,000 in 2004 to 113,000 in 2010, which is a decrease of over 5%. There was a 10% decrease in the numbers of speakers of Midiki, which is one of the smaller languages spoken in the Balkal district. The most drastic case of decline in numbers of speakers can be seen, however, in the figures for the languages of Atauru, which is the island um, adjacent to, to Dili, um, just a short way across the water. Numbers of speakers of the Rahesuk language dropped by 45% in this six-year period, whilst numbers of speakers of Resuk, another small language spoken on Atauru, dropped by 25%. When these languages become extinct, which they clearly will unless something dramatic is done to save them, Timor-Leste will lose the precious traditional knowledge vital to preservation of our biodiversity and the social fabric of Timorese society, not to mention the cultural values encoded in those languages. Up until recently, policy and practice in education supported the use of the two official languages of Tetum and Portuguese throughout the school system, with Portuguese assuming the role of principal language of instruction by grade three or four. In reality, Tetum is the first language of only around half of all East Timorese and somewhere between 15 and 25% of East Timorese claimed in the 2010 census to speak Portuguese. 
Moreover, a great deal more prestige and importance has traditionally been attached to the mastery of Portuguese as opposed to TETUM in current approaches to evaluation of teacher competencies and in the design of curriculum and programs of professional development for teachers. Just to share with you two examples, um, teachers had to undertake an exam in December 2009 to determine whether they possess the uh, requisite knowledge and skills to continue in the teaching profession. 80% of content of, the, of those exams was in Portuguese, um, which is quite surprising given the uh, you know, overall levels of understanding and fluency in the language that I, that I just mentioned. This drove home very clearly the message that you can't be a good teacher if you aren't a fluent speaker of Portuguese. We don't as yet have a textbook for the teaching of Tetum in schools, and yet we have a beautiful set of uh, grammar books with accompanying teacher manuals and student books for the learning of uh, Portuguese. Perhaps as a direct consequence of such policies of, uh, and practices which de deny the sociolinguistic reality of East Timorese families. The World Bank's um, early grade reading assessment conducted in August 2009 showed that 70% of grade one students were unable to read a single word in a simple text presented to them in both Tetum and Portuguese. This is a really very disturbing finding indeed, and in fact most East Timorese children spend three to four years in primary school without learning to read and write. I firmly believe that whilst um, Tetum and the other national languages of Timor-Leste have no place or at best an inferior one in the education system, we're bound to fail in our duty to provide our kids with a vital foundation for their future, for their future learning, and are therefore condemned to poverty as a nation. So what are we doing about it? Well, back in 2009, having read the results of the early grade reading assessment that I just mentioned, I approached our Minister of Education with an offer to draft a language in education policy in this work, our National Education Commission, which I chaired, had the benefit of the experience and the technical advice of a number of Australian education specialists and academics, including Professor Jo Lobianco from Melbourne University and Dr Carol Benson of Stockholm University. We launched the Language in Education Working Group comprised of members of the church, civil society organisations, government and teaching professionals in April 2010. The resulting policy was launched in the form of a public debate on International Mother Language Day in February 2011. The policy, um, just in summary, recommends that L1 or mother tongue instruction be introduced from preschool level right through to the end of the first cycle, which covers grades one to four, with oral tetum being introduced in grade two to facilitate a transa transition to Portuguese uh, medium by round about grade five. Reaction to the policy at the launch was generally quite positive with some teachers and senior Ministry of Education officials raising some reasonable doubts and questions in relation to the problems of learning materials and the impact of the policy on teacher mobility, uh, whether or not teachers hailing from different language groups would have su sufficient command of, their stu of students' mother tongues to be able to teach in it, etc. All very valid concerns. Some of our members of parliament were somewhat more circumspect, uh, deeming it necessary to pass a resolution in August 2011, reaffirming the importance of the role of official languages at all levels of schooling. Perhaps unfamiliar with the extensive research and literature available, which points to the supremacy of mother tongue education in supporting the learning of a second and third language, some of our legislators viewed mother tongue based multilingual education as a threat to our official languages. 
Nevertheless, a meeting of uh, senior education officials convened by our Minister of Education in December 2011 approved the implementation of a mother tongue based multilingual education pilot school program, which was recommended by our policy and um, recommended that it be conducted in 12 schools across three districts, making use of three local languages. The pilot got underway in um, March 2012, and by now our Timor-Leste National Commission for UNESCO, in partnership with a range of national and international NGOs, including Play Care Plan, um, the Alola Foundation, Child Fund, and the Mary MacKillop Institute, has conducted um, teacher training and community advocacy activities in all pilot school communities in the districts of Lautem, Manatutu and Oikusi. As I've mentioned um, already, the international community has invested large amounts of donor funding into the education sector over the past 10 years. However, key partner institutions such as the World Bank and many multilateral donors have failed to bring the combined learning and experience from other multilingual settings to bear in determining priorities for, for cooperation in the education sector in Timor-Leste, often branding the issue of language in education as too sensitive or too political. Nevertheless, there is nothing really political or contentious about the goal of improving learning outcomes for our nation's young people. And it should be patently clear to anyone who has followed closely the process of educational development since independence that a radical shift in language in education paradigm, in the, in the kind of language in education paradigm that I've described is necessary. I'm happy to report that this is happening. The experience and provisional outcomes of the mother tongue pilot um, I've referred to are very much informing the process of reform of the grade one to six curriculum, which is currently underway. And I'm very proud to be working um, together with a team of East Timorese education, educators, environmental experts, historians, social scientists and linguists to develop a curriculum which is relevant, reflective of Timorese social, cultural and historical realities and which fosters pride in the new nation, its past and its present and hope in the future. More specifically, I've been um, assisting with producing readers and storybooks for children on topics such as the resistance struggle. Um, in fact, just last week, I wrote a story around uh, the November 12 massacre, which probably many of you remember seeing on your television screens and indeed which is being commemorated um, today in, in Dili. Um, also other stories, um, books on issues such as uh, family violence and the importance of tolerance and inclusivity in social life, including in the education sphere. I've also been contributing to the development of a syllabus and detailed plan for the teaching of Tetum Grammar to primary level students. It's really um, very seminal and very heartwarming work Linked as it is to the rights of East Timorese children to receive an education rooted in their own unique social, cultural and historical reality, I feel that in doing this work, um, I'm continuing to full my, fulfil my mission as a human rights campaigner. Language and education can be tools of either liberation or of subjugation and oppression. Policy on language and education during the Portuguese and Indonesian colonial eras reflected the colonial authorities' need to establish and maintain power over its subjects, with those assimilating to the cultural, linguistic and social norms of the administering power being rewarded with jobs, the promise of social and career advancement and the lure of educational opportunities in the colonial metropolis of Lisbon or Jakarta. 
In Indonesian times, teaching styles emphasised the virtues of rote learning, of respect for authority, and were designed to discourage critical, independent thought. Critical thinkers, of course, posed a threat to the status quo of rule by force, of daily abuses of human rights, and suppression of Timorese identity. Only now in an independent Timor-Leste, and for the first time in history, are the citizens of our country being granted the opportunity and the right to affirm their identity through an embracing of their local languages and to create an education system which reflects a uniquely Timorese way of viewing the world and our place in it. I'm very conscious that um, if we succeed in granting a formal role to mother tongue in the national education system, we will have leapfrogged Australia where language and education policies in indigenous communities have vacillated between English immersion and acknowledgement of the importance of mother tongue as a bridge to the dominant language, all depending on the political hue of the government of the day. Let me share with you some other ways in which Timor-Leste is making a mark on the global stage in spite of its young age and lack of experience. As I mentioned earlier, Timor-Leste established a forum of fragile nations in 2010 with a view to reforming, re reinventing and committing to a new paradigm of international engagement in fragile and conflict affected countries and regions. The G7 Plus Forum represents um, close to 400 million of the world's poorest city, uh, citizens residing in some 20 of the most fragile nations from Africa through to the Pacific. It grew out of Timor-Leste's experience of rebuilding, including its observations that aid delivery, interventions and programs instigated by international actors are often inapplicable unsustainable and incompatible with the national agendas of recipient countries. Since its inception, the G7 Plus has sent a clear message to the global community and international act actors that external mandates and ideas can no longer be imposed on the world's most vulnerable peoples. Timor-Leste's leadership of this forum has earned it considerable respect internationally and it's been a source of national pride that a fledgling nation born from the ashes of destruction and conflict such as Timor-Leste could um, champion the interests of the world's poorest and the most fragile countries in important fora such as the United Nations General Assembly. In more recent times, of course, we have seen Timor-Leste stand up for itself and its sovereign right to a maritime boundary with Australia. The Australian government seems hell-bent on denying Timor-Leste this most fundamental right, one which will guarantee it economic strength and true independence. This underlines the chief concern of the G7 plus forum members that far too often the dominant paradigm in relations between donor and recipient nations serves to consolidate rather than reduce dependence in spite of all of the development rhetoric that we hear. Of course, the upshot of this is that wealthy nations are able to exert political influence, significant political influence, and we have seen this over and over again in Timor-Leste since independence. <clears throat> and here I risk being very un undiplomatic in saying that um, countries such as Portugal use uh, its historic links to the former colonial territory to encourage the Timor-Leste government to adopt Portuguese as co-official language, thus guaranteeing employment for its um, many thousands of unemployed teachers and um, work for its struggling uh, publishers of school textbooks. Whilst Australia does what a good neighbour would find inconceivable and bugs the government offices in Dili, presumably to secure an economic benefit in the oil and gas negotiations. 
The Australian Government's ongoing refusal to negotiate a permanent maritime boundary with Timor-Leste based on the norms of the international law of the sea violates Timor-Leste's sovereign right. The various temporary resource sharing agreements entered into by Australia and Timor-Leste effectively shortchanged Timor-Leste out of many billions of dollars. And those billions of dollars are vital if we're to ensure that every year more and more children survive to their fifth birthday and that some of the rights challenges that I've referred to earlier are addressed. I'd like to conclude by returning for a moment to the work that we are undertaking to enhance the role of local languages in the national education system. I'd like to um, pose a challenge to, to you and to Melbourne University um, by asking you whether you are able to assist us in affirming the importance of this quest, either through research into and documentation of our dying languages, facilitating educational and capacity building opportunities for our students and educators. I truly believe that in fostering um, recognition of the role of mother tongue in the acquisition of early literacy, we can avoid the failings of many other developing countries. Um, and a few developed ones too, and build a society and an education system which are just and inclusive. And in doing so, we're guaranteeing all the citizens of Timor-Leste access to their rightful share in the benefits of a hard-won independence. Thank you very much for listening to me this evening. <laughs> So um, we have the opportunity for some question and answers now. We have uh, some mics on either end and and just keep in mind when you're asking a question that we're actually recording. So um, say whatever you like, but just <laughs> it'll, it'll be on the public record. So do I have any uh, questions? Thank you. When I was in... Um Timor-Leste a couple of years ago, I was told that one of the problems with the education system was that the students, the, when they were doing their final exams, were actually tested in Portuguese and that, in fact, a lot of them had never done any Portuguese. Is that still happening? Um, indeed. Just I, I referred to the case of the um, tests for the Portuguese uh, teachers, the teachers of Portuguese, and how um, you know very difficult and challenging that was, given the very low levels of fluency in in the language, and certainly you know by extension the the you know I mean it's totally ludicrous really to um, be administering exams in a language that is you know just so foreign and. Um, is not spoken in daily daily life by, you know, um, more than probably fifteen percent of of the population. Um, but I guess you know I've always seen this to be one of the one of the many legacies of colonialism that um, educational administrators and particularly people of, a, of the generation of you know my husband who were educated in Portuguese times and in Portuguese language, you know there's a great deal of sort of prestige associated with. Um, being able to speak Portuguese well. And um, so, you know, hence a total disregard for the importance of Tetum, you know, whilst in the Constitution they both um, have the same status. Um, in practice, you know, a great more uh, emphasis has been put on, on Portuguese with the result that kids' um, learning is is damaged. So, I mean, to me, when I read that uh, World Bank study in 2009, I was not surprised at all that, you know, 70% of kids couldn't read a single word. Um, you know, and I think slowly, there, I mean, there's been, it's been a very fierce battle. I don't know if any of you uh, remember a number of years ago, it was the whole language issue became political football and there was an election looming and... Um, 
it was perceived because of my advocacy of the cause um, to be, uh, you know, policy of my husband's government, which ironically, the Minister of Education um, in his first government was very resistant to the idea of mother tongue. But people assumed that, oh, because she's going on about mother tongue, it must be his policy. And so the opposition then, you know, jumped on it and uh, decided to turn it into a political football. So we had a number of forums where we gathered um, members of the public to try and educate people about why, you know, if you don't get behind local languages and if we don't support them, um, they're going to die out and what a tragedy for, you know, for this society. Um, and it ended up, you know, being a, um, a bun fight basically and I had, you know, people throwing up throwing bits of paper at me and, um, you know, it was really quite dramatic. And, um, you know, it really just shows how fiercely... Um, I think the whole issue of language and, and identity, you know, people feel very strongly um, about it and it incites, you know, very deep emotions in in people. Sorry, I got off the track there a little bit. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm thinking from a European perspective because I was actually just looking at... Um, contact language integrated learning and um, looking at countries in Europe which have suppressed their uh, minor minority languages like France for instance um, which they see as going against their um, uh, consolidatedness as a country I guess compared to say Spain which has allowed those languages to develop but maybe potentially at some cost to uh, parts of the country wanting to be independent like, like um, Catalonia currently. Um, I accept what you're saying about the prestigiousness of Portuguese, but I was wondering whether one of the other reasons why people might support Tatum or Portuguese versus these hundreds, as you say, of smaller languages is about having the country be uh, consolidated as opposed to diverse. Yeah, in fact, um, the whole issue of national unity was raised um, by detractors um, of the policy saying, you know, by promoting uh, all these uh, local languages and therefore local ethnicities, um, we're undermining people's sense of being part of Timor-Leste. And I guess the message that we were um, trying to get across was um, these languages are being spoken in daily life across the country without any, um, you know, impact on the sense of people's uh, being part of uh, Timor-Leste. Every one of those different um, ethnic groups fought courageously for independence and, and um, you know, paid the ultimate price you know, for what? For Timor Leste's independence, um, and what we argued too was that, you know, the best way of building um, strong uh, national unity um, is to create um, an education system which is inclusive, that doesn't actually make any particular group feel excluded. I mean, the possibility for social unrest as a result of certain groups in the community feeling that they don't have a place, you know, that's a far greater threat to um, national stability and national unity in my view. But, um, yeah, those those were all arguments that were, were raised... Um, you know, at the height of the <laughs> the debate around mother tongue. Yes. Uh, Kirsty Dennis O'Neill is my name, uh, Bontade, and uh, thank you very much for your your presentation. I've had the privilege of visiting Timor Leste uh, several times this year, and I'm involved in uh, an investment process whereby uh, a company I'm I'm with will will establish itself there next year in the resources sector. And in looking for staff, um, of course, we, we are looking for people who are not only professionally qualified and have a, a good linguistic uh, reach in terms of a number of languages. The issue that uh, comes through very strongly for me is that in what I would call loosely the public court of uh, taxi driver opinion, I was surprised to encounter a degree of uh, antipathy, if not anger, at the decision to go with Portuguese uh, ahead of English because the, the forward-reaching or the forward-looking individuals I've met uh, who want to go into engineering and similar 
uh, scientific or technical uh, areas of qualification uh, increasingly were saying to us uh, that English is the language they see as being the, the, the choice of second language if they are to progress in their careers. Could you tell us a bit more about the bridging process that is occurring later perhaps in the secondary education system to promote the teaching of other languages, particularly languages that will assist the economic development of Timor-Leste? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that the current curriculum um, has a provision for the introduction of English language in either Year 7 or Year 10. Um, I know it was Year 7 under the previous uh, government. I'm not quite sure whether there's been a, a rethink um, of that. There's certainly an acknowledgement on the part of the government that English is an extremely important um, language for the future of the country. Um, and depending on who you speak to and whether that person has actually been educated in uh, Portugal or in Australia or in Indonesia, they will give you a different answer as to, you know, which language should have been chosen as the, as the official language. Um, I actually don't prescribe to the belief that English should have been um, chosen as the official language. I think English doesn't resonate historically or culturally with the um, East Timorese people in the way that Portuguese does. And probably having um, learnt alongside Indonesian at Melbourne University um, another Romance language, Italian, um, I, one of the things that attracted me greatly to East Timor when I first visited was the confluence of, you know, the Asian and the European influences in the culture. And I think it's a real, um, a real asset for the country, you know, particularly in terms of development of, of tourism, um, that it does maintain that, that um, heritage. Um, uh, I think... You know, the importance is the important thing really is um, an inclusive language policy, one that doesn't, you know, rule out uh, the importance of English. And I think if we get um, better language education in the early years of primary school, kids will find it really easy to transition to a second and a third language. The reason why they're having difficulties today is that they're not getting any solid foundation in their mother tongue. You know, they're surrounded, you know, it's an amazing, anyone who's been to Timor will know that it's just an amazing melting pot of languages. And, um, I mean, there's no other country anywhere in the world where um, you would be able to speak in one day four languages. So each, four of, the, each of the four languages that um, I speak, I'm able to, you know, use in daily conversation in, in Timor. And, that, you know, it's quite extraordinary and, um, you know, great privilege and um, also I think a, a real uh, resource for for the country. Most people talk about, you know, multilingualism as being, you know, some sort of a threat or, you know, a challenge. And, and it is a challenge, particularly for education, because, you know, you need to be able to um, develop teacher competencies and also learning materials, you know, across a broad range of um, languages and even in one we know that's, that's quite hard. Um, but, you know, I think there's, there is a, certainly an, an acknowledgement that um, English is, is very important. And it's my hope that, you know, with better teaching of uh, local languages, Tetum and Portuguese, kids will be able to acquire um, English much earlier and with greater, greater fluency. Thank you. Honey, a colleague, it is over 10 years since I've been to Timor-Leste and we did meet a few times when we were over there. I'll be very surprised if you remember me though. <laughs> I was working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we put together the first government website. It was in four languages, though I do confess for a very brief period of time, my attempt at Teton was not as well developed <laughs> and we did have a ministry for of relationships with foreigners. Um, <laughs> that got changed fairly quickly. I do have two questions. Um, the first is when a number of countries gain a level of independence, like Timor Leste, there is often a flowering and a real explosion of literature written in the uh, in the native language. Um, 
I don't see over the years that that has happened in Timor-Leste. And my second question is, is there not a possibility of a transition to a functional approach to this language issue? Which, of course, was an enormous issue in 2002 and 2003 as well. It hasn't gone away. I mean, my friends in Timor at the time were saying, this is a nightmare for us having to deal with all this. Mm -hmm. um, could it not be done on a functional level where on the district and the sub-district levels, on the day-to-day -day living that the native languages are used on the all of country level that you use that um, Teton becomes dominant for international relations um, Portuguese takes a central position and I must actually mention in relation to this there was a very good speech um, by Shanana in 2003 and he came up with a very telling line there would be no East Timorese identity if it wasn't for Portuguese hmm. yeah I can't say I really agree with that, but certainly a number of, um, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm well aware of that um, sentiment amongst uh, his generation. And I think probably if you asked him today, he would actually um, qualify that, that statement. Um, I think there was, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of fervour and a lot of political pressure to some extent too from Portugal back in in the period leading up to independence um, around the whole, you know, Portuguese language and identity and, you know, um, and I think if you asked Shanana today, he would um, have a different view. Um, as I said, I think there's there's still a lot of grounds for arguing that Portuguese has, has, a, has a big... Um, place in the future of the country. That may change and I think there's, it's possible that there may be a, um, a shift in policy at the national level and as we see local government actually being rolled out and um, being given a, a greater role across the country that, you know, local government may actually adopt their own um, policies uh, around language and how it's used in the education system in particular. Um, yeah, sorry, the first part of your question, I answered the second part <laughs> first. Uh, the first qu part related to um, other countries that have uh, you know, gained their native language having an explosion of literature written in that native yes. language. Um, I mean, in 2003, when I came back, I got to work and um, I put up the what was at that time the first English Teton um, dictionary on the internet. Um, I think it may still there may be a couple more now, but at the t you know there, there wasn't that explosion which I expected to see. Yeah, there has been um, um, gr a great deal of um, uh, pride in in Tetum and the and the development of Tetum. I remember when I first set up my foundation, the Alola Foundation, back in um, you know two thousand and one, two thousand and two, and we started to have a number of staff. All of the internal memos in the organisation between the staff were all written in Bahasa Indonesia. It was the only language that they felt they could communicate um, in with any degree of um, fluency. And nowadays, a total shift, and I mean this is a very rapid thing, and we're talking about less than 10 years. Um, now everybody communicates with one another internally and externally in Tetum. Um, there is, you know, there are efforts from NGOs like Timor Aid and Alola to um, encourage more literary production in Tetum. So every year there's a, a writing competition called the Historia Timor, which is encouraging particularly young people to write um, poetry and books and stories in, um, in Tetum. Um, so, you know, I think that will, that will change over time, but I think it's, it's a slow um, process. And the other thing is, of course, Timorese culture, it's a very, um, you know, very strong oral traditions. There's not um, a culture of books 
and of reading. Um, and, you know, that sort of shift takes possibly um, a generation. Um, I'm conscious as I'm doing this work for the Ministry of Education at the moment that, you know, here I am writing stories in Tetum for kids in Timor and I, and I feel like a complete fraud and I'm thinking now, like, why uh, – this. Timorese people should be doing this. Why am I doing it? And some of the my colleagues at the other end have said, look, you know, it's too big an ask to expect um, teachers who have grown up never having read a storybook, you know, a book for children, to actually expect them to to know how to write for, for children. And, you know, you can do it because you grew up with, you know, books around you and, um, you know, you've read stories to your kids, but... Most Timorese haven't had that um, experience, so I really think it's going to be a very gradual, gradual shift. But it's a very good, very good point. Thank you. You spoke about uh, the the group that Timor Leste has convened of developing nations and uh, inappropriate aid. Has that got to do with the countries who were giving the aid more interested in their countries benefiting from it through various organisations than the needs of the people receiving it? Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's probably sort of quite naive really to think that aid and development is actually about, you know, the interests of the, the recipient countries and you know I've been involved in this scene for you know a couple of decades and you know um, really it's uh, I think maybe the the assistance to to communities to help them um, develop and address their own needs is sort of like a side issue really I think you know aid and development really is about um, serving the interests of um, you know the donor, the donor nation. Um, it's a little, you know, it's a slightly cynical <laughs> way of looking at things, but I think it's quite realistic, um, unfortunately. And you know, look at the case of the permanent maritime boundary and the Timor Sea oil and gas negotiations. Here is a perfect opportunity for Australia to say Timor has these enormous needs that it's still um, facing. Um, why don't we actually just wind down our aid program and save ourselves the headache and actually just let them have what is rightfully theirs in the Timor Sea and with that money actually get themselves on their feet? You know, wouldn't that make sense? <laughs> but why, why not do that? Well, you know, so that you can continue to wield some political um, influence, so that you can continue to bug the officers of the, of the, of the government. You know, if Timor hadn't been weak um, institutionally and lacking in experience, that whole bugging operation would not have been possible. So, I mean, the whole thing is very reprehensible, but more reprehensible in that, you know, the Australian government deliberately set out to take advantage of, you know, Timor-Leste's weakness um, at an institutional level, the fact that it didn't have security guards there, you know, guarding and able to actually detect um, what was going on. You know, it's really deplorable. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And then we moved through this passport of, of different large organisations, not-for-profit organisations, being there, whether it was around water sanitation or education or, or uh, leprosy. And, um, and I suppose the lack of coordination and people being consulted sort of to within an inch of their life. Mm. Um, I attended an information session recently, the lovely jargon of capacity building, you know, that gets thrown around the whole time. So I'm one of the uh, large not-for-profits operating out of Australia and I asked them what was their policy in relation to the Timor Gap and they couldn't answer it. Mm -hmm. And it was that whole thing about sustainability. Meanwhile, you're getting dirty dirty diesel from China and, 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 and bad generators, you know. Like, mm. it just doesn't make sense. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. That was a really uh, telling conversation in some ways, unveiling, kind of unwrapping some of the complexities between language rights and education policy. It's not a straightforward 
uh, story and it kind of deeply resonates um, in my world in terms of Indigenous education policy. So there's a lot of relevance here, uh, both to our thinking more internationally and, and certainly in the case of Timor-Leste and also here in Australia. I'd like you to actually thank Kirsty for a fantastic, uh, fantastic <laughs> And also to acknowledge, I think she, that she has a gift for us here at the university and a challenge, <laughs> which, he, which you may have heard at some point. <laughs> yes. um, this is just a small token of my appreciation for giving me this opportunity to be here today. Um, it's just a few books and DVDs on Timor Leste, which I hope will um, take pride in your library and hopefully um, be you know, at the beginning of a Timor-Leste um, collection, a dedicated Timor-Leste Timor collection within the uh, university library. And I hope that it will then serve as a resource to the, to the many people that I don't know will um, um, join the call for uh, greater assistance, particularly in the whole area of um, linguistic uh, preservation and um, maintenance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.